Good afternoon. I am uh, Lieutenant General Sam Wilson, U.S. Army, retired. I work for Hamden Sydney College. May I extend a most cordial welcome to all of you, students, faculty, special guests, friends, to Vietnam 20 years after Voices of the War, a symposium that I hope will become known as the first of an annual September symposium series at Hamden Sydney College. The present occasion is made possible in part by a grant from Media General Incorporated of Richmond, Virginia. We are truly grateful to them. We also express our gratitude to an anonymous donor whose thoughtful generosity supports us significantly in this endeavor. It is our hope that with the lapse of 20 years since our combat forces departed the Republic of Vietnam, we have reached the plateau of historical detachment which will allow us to survey the events of that war in a reflective, non-emotional manner and to learn what we can from our collective experiences there. We would maintain that if there is any validity to the study of history, then there is validity to studying the history of the war in Vietnam. In that connection, I would refer to a remark made by one of Hamden Sidney's first trustees, James Madison, the father of our Constitution, who made clear that the American Republic would never be able to cease from the task of public or civic education. A popular government, observed Madison, without popular information or the means of acquiring it, is but a prologue to a farce or a tragedy or perhaps both. Knowledge will forever govern ignorance, said Madison and the people who mean to be their own governors must arm themselves with the power which knowledge gives. I might add also that Madison was echoing sentiments expressed centuries earlier by that great popular historian Thucydides in the prologue to his history of the Peloponnesian War. President Madison and his compatriot Jefferson understood well that the only true safeguard of human liberty and equality is a vigilant and knowledgeable citizenry. And it is to the education of such a citizenry that Hamden Sydney College has devoted its efforts from its inception in 1776, and this remains today our most important mission. Our present occasion is not a scholarly symposium, nor is it intended to be one. Rather, in the language of our students, it is Vietnam 101, a basic overview of the war in Vietnam and its attendant circumstances. There is a simple reason for such an approach. Most of you students assembled here from our own campus and from high schools and colleges and universities across the Commonwealth of Virginia were born after our direct involvement in Vietnam had ended. To you, Vietnam is a place name on the map. And the words war in Vietnam remind you vaguely of events that you've heard from your elders as they talked about that war about events that for you happened long ago and far away, events that evoke controversy still, and emotion, ambiguity, and mystery. Yet that same war has had, 
and continues to have a marked influence politically, economically, sociologically, and psychologically on the world in which you now live and which you are about to inherit. And there you have the implicit pur purpose of this three-day undertaking to provide you here and your guests with a balanced and comprehensive exposure to the many questions surrounding the Vietnam conflict. Conceivably, you may learn more about that conflict 360 degrees in three days than did the private soldier who viewed the war over his rifle sights for 12 months in the Vietnamese jungle. Think about it. At least such is our goal, our hope. This afternoon we kick off our deliberations with an initial examination of the Vietnam War in the context of the policy of containment against the backdrop of the Cold War. And we are indeed blessed to have with us a real, live, walking, historical document, a man who had a critical role in the formulation of overall U.S. political strategy as that conflict began to unfold. To introduce our distinguished guests, I would like now to call upon Dr. Scott Conley, the Provost and Dean of the Faculty at Hamden, Sydney, who will serve as moderator during our question and answer period. Thank you. Thank you, President Wilson. Dr. Walt Whitman Rostow reminds us of the path that link advanced seminars to foreign policy, that link schoolrooms and books to political action. The paths he's traveled during his career link the world of the professor to that of soldier, diplomat, presidential advisor, and public servant. Dr. Rostow also reminds us that a career is a life and that public responsibility need not end when one leaves formal government service. Yesterday he was up and about at 4 a.m. so he could meet his obligations to his students at the University of Texas and to meet his obligations to the mayor of Austin, Texas, with whom he is working on an innovative new, innovative new program on improving the quality of life in the inner city. Only after working a normal day in Austin did he pack up and come to Hampton, Sydney to work another day with us. With bachelor and doctoral degrees from Yale and study at Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, Dr. Rostow has held academic positions at Oxford, Cambridge, MIT, Columbia, and for almost a quarter of a century at the University of Texas. One of his former students, Dr. Kenneth Lehman, is a member of our history faculty at Hampton, Sydney. In fact, Ken told me that uh, Dr. Rostow teaches at the top floor, on the top floor of the Johnson Library. And to reach his classroom, he walked down a hall past a replica of the Oval Office and past a large photo mural of the Johnson cabinet with Dr. Rostow pictured prominently among that amazing group of people. Students entering the class knowing that the professor has something other than a theoretical grasp of the subject. The author of 31 books, Dr. Rostow teaches economics from a global perspective and from the perspectives of a historian and political scientist. A major in the Office of Strategic Services during World War II, Dr. Rostow won the Order of the British Empire and the U.S. Legion of Merit for his wartime service. He joined President Kennedy's staff in 1961 and went on to serve as President Johnson's special assistant for national security affairs. He stood at the side of presidents and given them advice about the most pressing issues of the day. He has also stood at the sides of many of the participants in this symposium as they worked together on vexing and sometimes seemingly intractable challenges. As witness, participant, and scholar, Dr. Rostow has helped to shape our foreign policy, and he's done much to help us understand what it is that we have shaped. So I present to you a soldier, an author of national policy, 
a dedicated student of world affairs, and a robust and energetic citizen, Dr. Walt Whitman Rostow. Provost. I'm here on this splendid occasion for several reasons. The first, despite other demanding commitments, I could not resist the call of General Wilson, an old comrade in arms of the 1960s. Second, I'm convinced that the underlying issue of our engagement in Southeast Asia in the 1950s, 60s, and the first half of the 70s is neither widely understood in our country, <clears throat> nor is that underlying issue behind us. The odds are good, I believe, that it will arise again in the lives of the students here, if indeed it is not now beginning quietly to assert itself. And there's a third reason to which I shall briefly refer at the end of this talk. The underlying issue was and is, it is likely to be, in general, the balance of power in Asia. In particular, who shall control Southeast Asia, the South China Sea, and the Malacca Straits? Uh, I believe we have uh, a map prepared which uh, was going to be flashed on the screen at this point, because the geography <clears throat> does indeed matter it mattered at the, in, the, in the 50s and 60s, and it matters still uh, if the map is retrieved and displayed. I shall try to show why. Uh, the, the wonderfully imaginative program that's been organized for these three days, capturing as it does some of the many facets, that's very interesting, but it's upside down. <laughs> That's the view from China. That's all right. That's... This is not fun. There's, there's the Malacca Straits, <clears throat> which is the route from the Indian Ocean. Uh, uh, Here is the South China Sea. And on the, this route, Russia, Siberia, Japan, China, South Korea, all the day. And uh, there's Cambodia, there's Vietnam. So I, I kind of like it the other way. Well, <laughs> there's something else with this show that's <coughs> usually not there. Uh, and that's it. Because what is not understood is the role of India. What's not understood is the role of India and its interest in Southeast Asia, which consists in one word, of the independence of Burma. And uh, so that the, with an area that's sensitive to the vital interests of all, uh, it's not uh, extraordinary to predict that the issue of the orientation of Southeast Asia will arise again. Um, I said that although this rather remarkable program has been created to turn the whole problem of Vietnam, Vietnam around in our hands and look at various facets, uh, human, political, uh, and all the other uh, dimensions in which a searching experience of this kind subjects a society like ours, uh, it requires also that we ask this question. Uh, why was there a solemn treaty uh, signed in 1955, uh, a Southeast Asia treaty, uh, and passed overwhelmingly in the Senate? What, ab what abiding American interests was it meant to serve? Did it serve those interests? Why did Presidents Carter and Reagan reassert the continued operational validity 
of the Southeast Asian Treaty with respect to Thailand, which is the heart of the problem of Southeast Asia. And then the question which only <coughs> the younger generation here can answer. <coughs> Are those interests likely to be likely to be relevant for your time and the next century. Now for some history. I cannot speak for President Clinton, but all his predecessors over the previous half century, ten of them, viewed Southeast Asia and what was once called Indochina in terms of the U.S. interest in assuring that South, the South China Sea not be dominated by a potentially hostile major power. That was President Franklin Roosevelt's view and the view of Presidents Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan, and Bush. You'll be relieved to know that I do not intend to spend the afternoon marching you through all ten of these worthies. But FDR's view is important. It came before we ever had a formal treaty in Southeast Asia. Uh, but the elements of our abiding position as a nation on Southeast Asia all were there. Uh, those of you who know some history know that <clears throat> uh, what he did there uh, in 1941 should have been, but was not, the beginning of the Pentagon Papers. What he did at a certain moment was to cut off the flow to Japan of American scrap iron, oil, and he sequestered the Japanese assets in the United States. Not many people know why he did that. He did it because the Japanese moved from Hanoi to Saigon. And Cordell Hall enunciated the American abiding interest when he said that control of that pudgy thumb reaching out into the South China Sea and threatening the Philippines uh, must be taken very seriously. And uh, behind that lay the view which Admiral Mahan had articulated in his famous book in 1890 uh, on, the sea, on the influence of sea power on history and which he argued that a forward position in uh, uh, a, uh, in the Philippines was necessary for the defense of the United States in the Pacific because there was no place to stop between western bases and the western Pacific bases and uh, Hawaii. And, uh, and there's another dimension that, of President Roosevelt's position which is abiding. When the Japanese argued with him and the Japanese ambassador that we should permit during the war, temporarily, he said, Japanese <clears throat> hegemony over China and the South China Sea. Uh, he, President Roosevelt replied he could not accept that, uh, but argued that Southeast Asia should be independent of all major powers. And uh, that is what the major powers should want and that is certainly what the people of Southeast Asia want. Now, uh, the, <clears throat> and, uh, the, the interests run to Australia, uh, New Zealand, Singapore, etc. And the Malacca Straits in relation to, to Singapore is a peculiar hinge in our story because it may surprise you to know that the person who first suggested to President Eisenhower a Southeast Asian treaty was Winston Churchill, who visited Eisenhower in the Waldorf Astoria Hotel after the election of 1952. And he suggested it because he felt that the weakening of the French position in Indochina could lead to a repetition of the tragedy which he carried to his grave, the tragedy of the sinking of the two battle cruisers. Uh, off the Cambodian coast, which permitted the Japanese to take Singapore from the land side, which was judged impossible. And so 
he felt that a recurrence of that danger and uh, Eisenhower was to act on it <clears throat> in 1954-55. And we acted on it also because it was felt that having painfully fought the Korean War to a standstill at the 38th parallel and frust uh, frustrated the communists there, we would gain little in the balance of power in Asia if we let them flow down uh, through into China to control Thailand, Malaysia, and Singapore and Indonesia. And uh, it was uh, this kind of background which led uh, President Eisenhower to uh, send his uh, Secretary of State, Mr. Dulles, out to the Philippines. At his side uh, was uh, Senator Dirksen. No, Senator Dirksen was in the hospital. Uh, uh, Senator Mansfield and Senator Humphrey. Uh, the two presidents, Kennedy and Johnson, who were to bear the full weight of that treaty as a burden to honor, were both in the hospital at that time, Kennedy and Johnson. But they supported the treaty. Now, as for Kennedy and Johnson, they had a, a very deep view of Asia, which went beyond, included, but went beyond strategy. President Kennedy's which I, is a very interesting story, it was formed in 1951 when his initial post-war obsession with the possibility of Russia again driving like Hitler to the West, uh, the, when he saw that wasn't going to happen in the wake of the Korean War, he went on a trip with two or three or four members of his family to the Middle East and India and into China. And he came back with a wholly new view of the world in which the critical importance lay in the developing parts of uh, Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. He shifted from a Europeanist view to a global view and came back and he stood up in the House of Representatives and did something rare. He said, I voted last year against President Truman's point four, against uh, foreign aid. I was wrong. And uh, when I got to know him in early 1958, uh, there was nothing in my own view of the developing world uh, which he had, at which he had not arrived on his own. And we worked together on what? Aid to India. And he did, did a remarkable thing in the Senate, working with Senator John Sherman Cooper, a Republican of Kentucky. He converted the whole foreign aid program from a, a program of scattered projects to a coherent program of looking at national programs and a consortium run by the World Bank. And, uh, but his view of Asia was extremely stable from the first day I knew him uh, to the last time I was with him. Uh, and uh, when he was in president, he did something which is worth recalling because uh, the discussion is so arbitrarily focused on Vietnam, that not many people recall that the plan that President Kennedy inherited in the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Eisenhower administration for the protection of Southeast Asia under the CETO Treaty was a plan that called for the defense of Thailand at the Mekong and in Laos. And the first crisis that he inherited uh, was the crisis in Laos. And he concluded after dealing with the Laos, and, who were charming people, but not terribly effectual in battle. And General Pumi, whom we supported, was not quite a Georgie Patton. That if he had to fight in Southeast Asia, he would fight on the Vietnam side, where he could bring sea and air power to bear, if necessary, much more effectually than way up uh, inside the land routes uh, that came up to the Laos and the Mekong frontier uh, uh, to, uh, of Thailand. Uh, so President Kennedy had a very steady view uh, of the importance of the treaty, its history, and, uh, and uh, General Taylor and I, before we went out to Southeast Asia in 1961, had long talks with him and we got a very clear picture of his view and wrote it down in a memo to, make, to him to make sure we understood it. And if any of you want to see what his view was, 
uh, and it was a very steady view. It's in a book of mine, uh, the memo is in a book of mine called The Diffusion of Power. It's in your library, I suspect. Uh, it was President Johnson who inherited, of course, the great crisis of 1964-65. And uh, I'm going to read you now a, 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 a fairly uh, extensive extract from an account of what went on. But you should understand that President Johnson had by that time a quite independent route, uh, come to his own views, and when he was set out as vice president um, to Asia by President Kennedy, he came back and recommended a much strengthened uh, alliance in the whole of the uh, Pacific area, an alliance which may now have come to life since November 1989 in the organization called the uh, Asian and Pacific Economic Cooperation uh, 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 Alliance. And, uh, but he said this at one moment after talking about the defense of Southeast Asia. In large measure, the Southeast Asia offers to nations like the United States is not the momentary threat of communism itself Rather, that danger stems from hunger, ignorance, poverty, and disease. We must, whatever strategies we evolve, keep these enemies the point of our attack. Now I come to something which <clears throat> I do not find in any of the courses being taught on Vietnam, or indeed in the books on Vietnam. And I'm going to read you a summary of a, uh, an article that appeared uh, uh, in the New York Times in 1971 by a man named Arnold C. Brackman, which summarizes an analysis in his book, which I commend to you, Communist Collapse in Indonesia. Tomorrow, he writes in 71, marks the sixth anniversary of America's massive intervention in Vietnam. Today, that decision is almost universally characterized as a mistake. If Vietnam alone was at issue, it would be hard to fault the popular assessment. But the stake six years ago was more than Vietnam. Indeed, one of the extraordinary features of the Vietnam War is that despite the continuing and deepening debate about Vietnam, most Americans have either forgotten or worse, are unaware of the compelling circumstances that prompted Mr. Johnson's decision. In October and November 1964, the military situation in the South was desperate. District capitals and villages were falling, for the first time since the creation of the South Vietnamese Liberation Front in 1960, Hanoi introduced its first regular army units into the South. Against their will, Laos and Cambodia were being turned into North Vietnamese supply corridors. Indonesia's Sukarno conferred with the Peking leadership, and his aides confirmed that the rapidly developing alliance between Jakarta and Peking was aimed at a division of Southeast Asia into respective spheres of control. Sakharov quickened the pace of his armed forays against the Malay Peninsula, Singapore, and the northern Borneo states. Britain assembled 40 warships off Singapore, perhaps the last major naval concentration of the Royal Navy, and together with Australia and New Zealand, rushed to the defense of the Islamic Federation of Malaysia. Australian and Indonesian warships clashed off Singapore, the largest port in the Commonwealth after London. Indonesia bolted from the United Nations and worked with China to lay the groundwork for a rival organization. At a New Year's Day diplomatic reception in Peking, Field Marshal Chen Yi, the Chinese Foreign Minister, boasted, Thailand is next. In January, China and Indonesia concluded a pact which both later called, and this is the most inelegant title I have ever heard of an international organization, the Jakarta, Phnom Penh, Hanoi, Peking, Pyongyang axis. Each of the axis powers except Cambodia was outside the UN. Sukarno, in a candid moment, said the axis strategy for defeating the United States and its Asian Pacific allies was for China to strike a blow against the Americans in Vietnam from the north, while Indonesia struck Malaysia and Singapore from the south. And uh, the, the Dr. Ismail Rahman, then Malaysia's home minister, publicly felt that if a nutcracker with one prong stretching southward from Hanoi and the other northward 
from Jakarta succeeded, it would have been difficult for Malaysia, Thailand, and Singapore to preserve their independence. President Macapagal of the Philippines warned that if the United States abandoned Vietnam at that time, how much more impatient would Sukarno, Sukarno's Indonesia be to bring the Philippine archipelago into its orbit? His Australian counterpart, Prime Minister Sir Robert Menzies, spent, uh, openly held that if Vietnam were abandoned at the outset of 1965, in the long run, and not so very long run at that, Australia would be menaced almost at our doors. Clearly, if the United States had not intervened when it did, Brackman writes, the Commonwealth position to the South would have been untenable. A consolidation of the Axis would have confronted the United States and its allies with a line of hostile, militant, and authoritarian states from Korea to New Guinea. I quote this at such length without uh, apology because the exact situation that President Johnson faced, which forced him against his will, against his interest, uh, to put large forces in uh, Asia was not some narrow political crisis in Vietnam. It was a crisis in Asia which involved New Zealand, Australia, Singapore, uh, the non-communist forces in Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, and Japan was as anxious uh, that we act to head this off as any other country in Asia. And of course, South Korea uh, put several divisions in with us. And it's this sense of what was going on in Asia that was almost wholly missing from the debate about Vietnam in the 60s. Now, the, uh, uh, President Johnson in fighting the war in Vietnam uh, took the view that this was not a simple matter of a, a, uh, a military struggle. He was loyal to what he had written to President Kennedy when he came back from Asia in 61. And he uh, took the view in particular that uh, the countries of Southeast Asia must cooperate with each other because the United States could buy time for them, but it could not uh, permanently defend them or indeed support them through foreign aid. And so he joined his war policy to a policy throughout Asia of uh, uh, encouraging the development economic and social of all of Asia and especially encourage them to cooperate with each other because he sensed that they were growing up fast, that the influence of the United States might be very important in the 60s, but it would gradually become marginal and that our job was to see that the diffusing power away from Washington but also, again, away from Peking and Moscow, be organized. And it is an ironic experience that we all had, uh, because one of the first things that happened in, when I was going to the White House in early uh, 19, uh, in April 66, was the President asked me to develop some new ideas in foreign policy, and, and uh, he said, you know, I've made my commitment in Southeast Asia, I've made my commitment to the Great Society, but history won't stand still. And we had a, a, a big regional organization meeting in Latin America with the heads of all the uh, governments. And he made a trip through Asia in the autumn. And I felt great compassion for him because I knew at the end of it he was going to have an, an operation, a gallbladder operation. And he was in very great pain. And it was a most intensive trip from one end of Asia to another. And he talked not about Vietnam. He talked about the urgency of Asia organizing itself in cooperation economically and socially and for its own long-run defense. And uh, that was hardly noted in the American press. Uh, the magazine Fortune had an article 
They said it's too bad that the news reporting of the Manila Conference, which was at the center of this, left the impression that it was principally concerned with cooking up a political formula for inducing Hanoi to negotiate the Vietnam War. The deepening of American involvement in that war unavoidably overshadowed all other considerations at Manila, but war waging did not dominate the agenda. The principal discussions concerned the future shape of the Asia-Pacific world. In a quiet way, there was a good deal of talking back and forth about economic and social development and about how various difficulties might be overcome on a collective basis. And uh, the alliance between President Johnson and a group of statesmen in Asia who felt equally that they had to uh, create uh, an organized system in Asia if they were to stand on their feet is one of the great untold stories. Uh, uh, Prime Minister Holt of Australia was part of that group. And that's why President Johnson, he was a very loyal friend, that's why President Johnson just picked up and went to his funeral. Uh, astounding the Australians that he turned up across the Pacific to do that. And uh, uh, the, in that spirit, the Indonesians and Malaysians, Indonesians now clear of Sukarno, uh, uh, settled a very dangerous quarrel and permitted ASEAN to be formed. And this was a period in which the average rate of growth of the Southeast Asian nations was 9% a year, which is an astounding rate. It's about the rate at which China, south of China, is now going. And uh, this was the perspective uh, namely the future of Asia, in which President Johnson and his aides uh, viewed uh, uh, the circumstances of the time. Uh, and now the story from 69 to 75 is a uh, painful story, and uh, it's not yet sorted out. It starts off with, I think, President Nixon finding that situation on the ground in Vietnam a year after the Tet Offensive was much better than he had thought. Much more of the country was under control. The political system was working. And uh, uh, he uh, launched the policy of Vietnamization, which uh, uh, had been started earlier. And, uh, uh, and then, of course, by a series of events I will not go through, uh, we ended up with the debacle of 1975. It's a story which, as I was saying to some of the students, is worthy of, of one of them in this time, writing either a great history that was objective, bringing together all the complex strands, which include Watergate and uh, the opening to China and many other things, and uh, uh, I would, or writing a great novel like War and Peace. And I won't try to take that grand subject of the the movement from a relatively good position in early 69, but a divided and debating country to the tragedy in 75. I won't go through that now. But looking back on the whole story, uh, let me give you some notion of, of how it looks uh, to some of the people who were involved in it. Uh, I'm just trying to find a, the quotation from Howard Beale. Howard Beale, uh, whose quotation is somewhere around here, uh, was the ambassador. And what he says is very simple. He says, uh, at the moment, he was writing in about 1987, uh, there does not look to be any great danger. But it was very different when Australia made its decision. Then all of Asia, uh, seemed to be threatened, and in Australia, the ominous goings-on in Jakarta uh, were extremely serious, evoking as they did the fact that the Japanese got down uh, to New Guinea in the, in the Second World War and threatened the northern frontier of uh, Australia. And he, he said, now uh, all is quiet. Uh, uh, the Vietnamese are communist uh, and miserable, he said, and, uh, but Asia as a whole is vibrant and uh, that is the achievement of the Americans and uh, we joined them so this might be possible. And uh, that is the, 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 the view 
I, I would say that is, uh, uh, my wife and I found as the common view in Asia when we went through and talked to 14 countries in uh, 1983. And uh, it, I don't know whether you, I told you earlier that both Carter and Reagan uh, take, took very definite positions on this area and they reaffirmed uh, the, uh, the, as I said, the relevance of the Southeast Asia Treaty to the defense of Thailand, including what's known as the Rusk Tanat Addendum, which asserts that the United States will honor the treaty in defense of Thailand if Thailand is attacked, no matter what any of the other signatories do. So we're not clear of Southeast Asia. We are still committed there, and uh, uh, we uh, should bear that in mind. Now the future. Uh, one of the reasons I came is because I'd like to share with you a perspective of mine on uh, the future uh, uh, in the next century. In China, the most important thing happening in the world now, I think without question, is the economic and social momentum in China. They've been running the economy at about 12% rate of growth per year. And the vitality uh, of the, the, tra the traditional vitality of the coastal ports is extending inland. All of this stems from the decision in 1978 of Deng Xiaoping to free the peasantry from control by the communes and return decisions in agriculture to the family. And they responded with an enormous surge of output uh, so soon that the food was so abundant, they began to shift to small-scale manufacturers. And right now, this revolution and in industrialization is going back into the inland, uh, corroding the Communist Party. And uh, China will undoubtedly have setbacks and difficulties, but I don't think anybody who's been following developments uh, does not believe that China will move on to technological maturity in the next 20 or 30 years. By technological maturity, I mean they will then command all of them existing technologies. And I have no doubt that the greatest fact about the next 50 years and the next century is that one country of a billion and a half people, China, six times the size of the United States, will then command all of them existing technologies. And India may well be even ahead. I first worked with India when it was regarded as a subject for triage, hopeless. It now has a middle class of 200 million, about the size of the middle class in all of Europe. And I do believe that this is the massive fact that we should all contemplate as we look to the next century as the central fact the emergence of two powers, each about six times the size of the United States, but technologically competent, with all that implies. The question of war and peace very much hinges on these two countries, and it hinges on two questions. One, will they or will they not go into a phase of rivalry with each other like that of France and Germany, which has cost the two countries so much, Europe so much, and themselves and their people so much. And will a mature China assert itself unilaterally in the Western Pacific as a very great power? And if so, will they confront, uh, the, if they will confront the interests of Russia, Japan, US, and many other countries? Uh, there are very good arguments as to why they should not do that. Uh, the past history of countries that sought hegemony when they came to technological maturity is a history of tragedy and it takes up most of the 20th century. Germany twice, Japan, and then Russia, all ending tragically, but making, uh, you know, that was a hell of a way to spend a century dealing with these fellows, you know, and that's what we did. And that's what my generation had to do. And I know I wish that you, the next generation, avoid it. And I think it's avoidable. But for it to be avoidable, we have to be something we have never been before. 
We have to be forehanded. We must not pretend that we're above wicked things like the balance of power. We must work collegially in the uh, uh, APEC and in the whole Pacific community. Uh, we must recognize the rise of China and India to stature and to positions of dignity, but we must be there and not out to lunch. Uh, the history of the wars of the 20th century is very much a history of the United States pretending that it's isolation, isolationist or indifferent uh, and, uh, and then when somebody takes advantage of the, what they think is an opening, we make a federal case of it. I once suggested that everybody in the State Department should have on his wall a statement uh, which Dean Rusk, uh, a man of uh, total reliability, said that uh, Vyshinsky, the Russian foreign minister, once said in the headquarters of the UN at a UN meeting in New York, he said, the Americans deceived us on Korea. And if you look at how we behaved before the Korean War, it really does look as though we, we, we sucked them into uh, going for South Korea and then hit them with a blindside block. And it's not, a pretty good case could be made that we did to Saddam Hussein. And we gotta stop it. Because we can't afford any, any more wars in a world where everybody and his brother are gonna have nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass, mass destruction. Therefore, I believe that APEC, this uh, new organization of Asia and the Pacific, uh, has enormous responsibilities and uh, has a great constructive task in the next 50 years and uh, on the conduct of that constructive task I think the issue of war and peace may depend in the Pacific and uh, this is no new view cooked up for this occasion I've done a lot of work on Berlin and when the Berlin Wall came down I was asked on two national television shows that night and on both of them, I shocked uh, my interrogators, who usually uh, are pretty voluble, shocked one of them into silence for a while, by saying, I thought that the announcement in Canberra, of which he had not heard, was more important than the wall coming down. Because in Canberra, that's the announcement, very quiet announcement, that the first intergovernmental organization for the whole Pacific Basin had been formed. So, but that's your job of the next generation, and I wish you well with it. Now, I don't really apologize for talking to you thus far in terms of uh, geography and the balance of power and national interests. For as far back as history is recorded, and indeed throughout American history, from the struggle for independence down to the present, uh, these are the factors that have been the foundation for how na other nations and ourselves have behaved. And uh, as much as we Americans have resisted the idea that the balance of power matters, uh, these are the strategic factors that have determined how we as a nation have behaved when the chips were down. We put aside our rhetoric and faced up to what our vital interests were, often at great cost. But I said at the beginning there was a third reason I'm here. It concerns my generation, mainly more than yours, but your generation as well. The war in Southeast Asia ended in 1975 in a dreadful debacle, an apparent total defeat. And the harshness of that defeat in the field should not be shirked. The war in the field ended in a terrible mess, to put no fine point on it. It left almost all the Vietnam veterans, their families, indeed their countrymen, believing they had fought, died, suffered in vain. But the fact is that by holding the line in Southeast Asia for 10 years, from 1965 to 75, the United States bought time. And they bought time for a new and vibrant increasingly democratic Asia to emerge. In 1965, the dominoes were palpably falling and there was no responsible person in Asia who didn't know that. Uh, in 1975, when Saigon fell, uh, 
uh, ASEAN existed, a new proud Asia, quite unafraid of the communists, simply went and had an ASEAN meeting at Bali and tightened the organizational structure of, uh, uh, of uh, the, uh, the system. Uh, I've known Lee Kuan Yew for a long time and he uh, has often said that we were buying time and he told the Asians uh, that if they didn't use that time well, they didn't do deserve to be saved. And before I went to a, a session uh, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the, uh, I asked him if he still had that view. He said, yes, I, uh, he wrote back, yes, I have, still hold that view and I tell all the journalists who come through, but they never report it. And I don't suppose that view is going to prevail uh, uh, unless there are radical changes. And uh, the, the London Economist in 1990 said, Indo Indochina was not saved and is today communist and wretched. Yet because America intervened, Southeast Asia is free and striving and Indochina is being irresist irresistibly tempted Southeast Asia's way. This is the time for America to declare victory. I have every reason uh, to share Lee Kuan Yew's pessimism about persuading other folks to this view. Uh, and, uh, but, that is, uh, but it is my view that in sooner or late, that view will prevail. And in the two days in ahead, however, you will see and here, a good deal of, uh, which will lead you to understand uh, how far away from my view, uh, the view of many others is of the war in Vietnam. But as I say, I have not the slightest doubt that sooner or later Americans will come to understand what thoughtful Asians already know. That those who fought in Asia in these 10 years, who held the line while Free Asia prospered, gained confidence, and learned how to cooperate, including, above all, those whose names are on the memorial in Washington. They did not fight and die in vain, and among other reasons, that is why I came here today. Now your questions. recognize you and if you would come to one of the three microphones across the front of the auditorium there's one in the middle at the end of the middle aisle and if you will identify yourself before you speak so we can have a record of your question and who you are yes sir please come to the mic and tell us who you are Thank you. My name is Broadnax Robertson. I was a student here from 1950 to 52. I left to go to Korea with the Army and graduated from Georgetown. Got my master's from Longwood down the road. It's a happy occasion for me to be back uh, for this uh, symposium. My question, Dr. Rostow, and I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation, uh, what could we have done differently from 1969 to 1975 to change that outcome in 75, in your opinion? Or was it inevitable? Uh, looked at after the event, everything in history is inevitable. <clears throat> that is to say, uh, uh, people doing their doctoral theses can explain why the study there, things came out the way they did because there were forces at work. But before the event, uh, I do not believe the outcome was inevitable in many historical cases, and certainly not in this case. 
because in 69 we had a situation in which uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, our armies in the field in the South Vietnamese were moving forward very fast, consolidating, consolidating. the political process in Vietnam uh, was uh, gaining strength. And uh, I think there were, in my judgment, some errors. The most important, I think, was that President Nixon uh, gave the Hanoi great encouragement by trying to outflank uh, the Democratic uh, opposition to the war uh, by saying, oh, I'm not going to just cut down the forces. I'm going to take them all out. I take them all out in, in what, in four years? And uh, I guess it was three years to 72. And uh, uh, the Hanoi took the view, well, you know, we live around here, three years isn't too long. And they began to negotiate with the Russians and, uh, to get ready for the, the great attack in 1972. And they were beaten in that attack. The, the Battle of 1972 has never been fully reported or accurately reported or taken in. By that time, Americans were off on something else. And, and uh, there were no Americans on the ground. American air power was very important for a particular reason, that the Russians had armed the North, North Vietnamese with great big tanks, much bigger than any and more power than any in the South. And they had to be dealt with mainly by American air power. But the uh, South Vietnamese fought on the ground and held their ground, and the North Vietnamese had to withdraw. And that was the basis, along with the mining of the Haiphong Harbor, for uh, getting the peace agreement in 1973. And uh, typically, exactly as they did with us, the Hanoi tried to pull back from positions they'd taken, and then the President Nixon bombed Hanoi with B-52s, and. Uh, uh, the side of the gallows concentrated their mind wonderfully and they went back to their old positions. The agreement was signed. And as near as I can make out, uh, if President Nixon and his successor had honored the commitments he made to Tew in terms of foreign aid and aiding the Vietnamese, the, the taking over by the Vietnamese military, there's a very fair chance that agreement would have held. Uh, and, but then President Nixon got into Watergate, and uh, uh, the Watergate Congress was elected, and a whole lot of other forces, including the ping-pong diplomacy and the opening with China, and people said, oh, the hell with it. And uh, we cut the throat of the Vietnamese uh, by cutting down the aid to them from 1.8 billion to 900,000, 900 million, and to 450 million. And, and, uh, and uh, if you don't believe that account of why, uh, at least that reconstruction, you should read uh, the very honest report of this victorious North Vietnamese general as to why they decided they could safely go into South Vietnam in 1975. And it's an account of all the forces laid out, very factors laid out, including the cut in the aid and Two being forced to fight a poor man's war, and loss of mobility, and uh, loss of morale, and then in the United States, a new president being put in, Mr. Ford, and uh, the oil prices mentioned, and unemployment, and he said the Americans are distracted, they won't do a damn thing, and we didn't, and they got away with it. Uh, so I don't know, I, you can't reconstruct history, and I don't really believe that any of us are smart enough to do it because we don't understand all the factors that are operating at a given time. But you ask me, do I believe it was inevitable? And my answer is no. Could you give us your name, sir? My name is Virginia. Oh, yes. Uh, I was very interested in your comment about uh, one part of the United States policy as being uh, seeing that no one power dominated uh, that area of the world. Uh, did policymakers in Washington and elsewhere take into consideration the desire, perhaps, of Ho Chi Minh, uh, along with other uh, colonized nations, 
uh, subject of Western imperialism and the desire of Ho Chi Minh and his followers to throw out the French and keep the French from dominating Indochina. And did, did the policymakers uh, take into consideration what I've read about, and that is uh, the Vietnamese hostility toward China and the Vietnamese nationalism itself in uh, shaping our policy and our strategic aims. And uh, if they did, what did they do with those considerations? I think that the uh, nationalist strand in Ho Chi Minh uh, was recognized and more important. Uh, and I think it was a sense of Vietnamese nationalism north and south that led to our refusal to back the French uh, at Dien Bien Phu. Uh, it was regarded as hopeless uh, in, by President Eisenhower and the leader of the Senate, Lyndon Johnson and others, to try to fight the battle to keep communism out of, of Vietnam uh, by keeping the French in. And then came the decision what would happen in his polls. He knew that uh, uh, President uh, uh, Truman and ended up in that kind of a war with polls, which proved to be lower, incidentally, than Mr. Nixon's polls when he resigned. There's nothing that's harder and more unpleasant. So he didn't get it. He did get it to have freedom of action. That's right. And he thought that might help deter Hanoi. But he was not anxious to go to war. And it, was, it had a long history in his judgment that it was a correct policy for the Senate coolly to consider a problem and give the president uh, the flexibility to act militarily. But he sure didn't go rushing through. He waited from August of 1944 to the end of July 1964 uh, to 65. And he, as I say, was the last man aboard. But, so I don't think there was any conscious attempt to deceive anybody. And he did not do this in order so he could have his nice war of his own as soon as possible. Mr. Sheehan said on, you know, on page 379 in that book, and he, he alleged that Secretary McNamara and Secretary Rusk were in fact were aware of and, uh, and helped. Uh, well, I, I'm sorry, I, no, I haven't... In, in secret testimony, yes sir, I just want to tell you that well, there has I, been I, something read that the rest of us have read and maybe have studied that's extremely controversial. Well, I've never and I appreciate the book. Uh, since I left government, I've had a very good time. As I told Hugh Sidey once when he called, I said I've had my students and I've enjoyed them and I've written 17 books and played 4,500 sets of tennis. And if you write 17 books, you don't have a time to read Neil Sheehan. Deeply, Thank you very much. Deeply appreciate it. We will take a question here and then move to this side. I'm Joe Lane, uh, lecturer in political science here at Hampton, Sydney. Uh, I wanted to return to the question on the media and the press and the war and um, kind of the problems that came out of that. Because at one point during your talk, you made the comment that there would come a time for members of the younger generation of my generation to put aside the rhetoric and public relations and to stand up and take action on behalf of the United States strategic interest. However, it seems to me that um, one of the great problems of Vietnam, maybe one of the great tragedies, is precisely that America has great difficulty acting on a basis of strategic interest and that the red rhetorical presentation of any conflict is likely to be the one that raises the expectations of the American people. Uh, in the case of Vietnam, the notion that uh, we are fighting to keep communism out of this country and the reason we were fighting communism was, had nothing to do with the South China Sea so much as the fact that communism was evil and we wanted to protect these people from it. Uh, similarly, in the case of uh, the Gulf War recently, the idea that um, we, 
Saddam Hussein was an evil man and the Kuwaitis had to be rescued from him. And that this leads eventually, always, um, to a certain disappointment in the American people. When you save Kuwait, the Emir doesn't turn out to be a great guy. Or when you actually get into Vietnam, it doesn't turn out to be so clear cut in war which side's doing the great thing for humanity and which side's doing the bad thing. And, and then because we've explained the conflict in these rhetorical terms, we can't go back and say, well, what we're really interested is, in is this strategic interest. Um, I wondered if you could say something to these young men about how we go about building a democratic foreign policy based on consideration of strategic interest rather than kind of rhetorical show. That's a great question. And uh, uh, if you, I, I, I say this not because I won't answer, but because some of you may want to follow it up. Uh, in writing books on foreign policy, I did two big ones, one the U.S. and the World Arena and the other Diffusion of Power. I knew that the, everything that I selected and every conclusion that I might draw was colored by my view of the national interest. And believing that there is no such thing as objectivity, but that what an author owes his reader is to be honest about his presuppositions, I put an appendix in stating my view of the national interest. And so that it was perfectly fair with the reader and he could say it was nonsense or whatever, <coughs> or correct for it. In though that appreciation, I went right head on into the question you've raised. Because we are, I guess most countries, in the West anyway, have a, a conflict between morality and national interest. Uh, but it's heightened in the United States by a particular circumstance. That we are a country bound together not by continuity of geography, because we started a string of colonies and went quite far away, uh, nor by community of religion or race, but by a set of ideals and ideas about what the good society should be and what good government should be. And the truth is that uh, this ambivalence, which I suspect is shared by other nations, there is shared in different degree, is particularly acute. And that's why we have such trouble before the event acknowledging that we care about the balance of power. We're above it. All those dreadful Europeans worried about the balance of power. But you know, we're, 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 we're the rich, we're the, uh, the man on the hill, and, and the, the, the city on the hill. Uh, but when the push comes to shove, uh, I, I, I live in Texas, and I remember now historically, vividly, I was not there, of course, when the Zimmerman letter uh, note was discovered, sent to Mexico, which said to the Mexicans, uh, if you go with us in this First World War, we, we, uh, we'll give you back Texas. Well, that sure sharpened the minds of the people in Texas who were pretty, you know, not very much interested in that war in Europe. They got interested. And, uh, you know, uh, so when the chips are down, we behave like a nation state, but not quite, because take Vietnam, and I'll take it on head. The, all wars are, are very evil and bloody and tragic. And, but the people in, who opposed President Johnson's policy uh, very much uh, uh, were moved by the inhumanity of that particular war and the civilians who suffered. Now the civilians were, suffered much more in the Korean War because the war went up and down the peninsula sweeping through cities and so on. But it was an honest response of people who didn't like the war to heighten the immorality that was involved in it. Whereas others like myself, for example, felt we had a commitment to the South Vietnamese. They were a struggling post-colonial country. Uh, their military men weren't there for a year. They fought till they were carried out feet first. And they fought very bravely and with increasing skill. And so the moral factor could go either way, depending on how you viewed it. But I, we're at our best when we feel an honest convergence between our ideals and our national interests. And we have awkwardness in doing something for pure national interest. 
if people are really, I mean, for pure uh, idealism, uh, if we don't feel our major national interests are involved, and we have trouble doing something cynically for pure national interest, if we don't feel some sense of moral. And I discuss this ambiguity and problem, and I, there's no cheap answer I know to it. Uh, and you quite correctly pointed to this as one of the abiding problems of our forming a stable foreign policy. Because we'd like to believe, until the chips are down and we're, someone's bombing Pearl Harbor or uh, submarines on the Atlantic or whatever, we'd like to believe that we're above all this nonsense. But when it comes to, you know, and we behave like Dr. Johnson's uh, famous statement, depend upon it, sir, when a man knows he's to be hanged in a fortnight, it concentrates his mind wonderfully. It was a very dangerous rule to follow in a nuclear age, and it's going to be more dangerous in the next century, so we better try to find a more stable synthesis. But if you think I have one in the back of the book uh, to pass out, I don't. It's a matter of it's a matter of maturity. I mean, we all know that our lives are filled with conflicting personal impulses, and we try to do the best we can with these conflicts. Uh, and we, as a nation, we got to face up to our limitations, uh, as we must as human beings. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'm Matthew Michael, class of '95, here at Hampton, Sydney. Dr. Ostow, I was intrigued by your emphasis today on the importance of collective security, and I had two questions relating to that topic. First of all, do you think unilateral involvement in Vietnam would be possible today if we had to? And then secondly, with the emerging of China and India into superpowers and possibly even mega powers beyond superpowers within the next coming decades, how do you think that will affect the uh, use of collective security and multilateral actions? Do I think we should act, uh, we're, we could act unilaterally in Vietnam? Well, of course we didn't. Uh, we had a treaty and a number of people honored the treaty. Uh, it's very hard to say whether we'd act unilaterally or multilaterally until you know the circumstances. It'd have to be some very big threat to the national interest that was over, perceived as a threat to the national interest by a very big majority. I mean, uh, to go back to fight in Vietnam is, would be quite a thing for Americans to do. Uh, any time in the foreseeable. I just, is this on? I just mean that uh, is unilateral action still possible, or do we have to first screen everything through the United Nations and build a coalition, such as happened with the Gulf War and Clinton seems to be doing in Bosnia and Somalia and all around the world? I see what you mean. I think, it, uh, in general, I'm sure that it'll be our instinct to move multilaterally. And that, in a world of diffusing power, that makes sense. But I can think, you know, there could be some things that happen in which we said, this is raw national interest, and to hell with you, I want to do it. And it'd have to be, however, a very acute uh, challenge to our national interest perceived by an overwhelming majority that would lead us to do that. We try to act collectively. Now, your second question was what? It was, I wanted to answer. Do you think that China and India, since they've possibly could become such huge mega powers will still be subjected within you know collective security of a treaty alliance with say a Thailand and a Japan yeah. or do you think that they'll be able to more justifiably act on their own? Well it, it, you see the fascinating thing about nuclear weapons and I dare say other weapons of mass destruction is that they reduce the relevance of the industrial establishment to military power. Uh, when I gave an inaugural lecture at Oxford in November 1946, when I was the visiting professor of American history, I gave it on the future American stance on the world scene. And I pointed out that future historians would be mildly uh, amused by the irony of the United States producing a weapon at the end of the Second World War which was bound to violate the simple proportionality between steel production and all the conventional measures of industrial strength and effective power in the field. And, uh, and indeed, that did cut down our effective power in the field. And uh, we did all right. We survived the Cold War and didn't have a hot war, etc. But now we may, with the, <laughs> with the Chinese and Indians coming up in a big way, uh, 
uh, benefit from that disproportion. For it'll be a puzzlement for everybody as to uh, what kind of usable force is there in a world where everyone's got nuclear weapons, or a great many countries do. And uh, it, it may be that it'll turn out there's very little rationality even in using ground forces, except in extreme circumstances. So my short answer is that I would not, uh, I'm not dogmatic with my students, but I do warn them against one thing. I said, beware of linear projections. And uh, uh, I think the Indians and Ch Chinese are going to get very, very big uh, economically and otherwise, but I don't think that means that they can uh, just throw their weight around militarily uh, without having second thoughts about its effectiveness. I'm uh, Ken Lehman, your former student, and uh, this is actually the first time I've heard you speak on the subject of Vietnam. It's been very interesting. But you've taken Vietnam out of the Cold War context in which we've always tended to put it, and put it into a larger geopolitical context. And uh, you suggested at the end that uh, at some point we will be teaching in our history classes, I'm a history professor, that perhaps in some sort of qualified way we won this war. Um, before I'm ready to teach that in my classes, I would like for you to lay out in front of us here a little bit what you think might have been the scenario in case we would not have sent men to Vietnam. What might have happened instead? Uh, that's a very good question. President Johnson once addressed himself to it. The, the question, if you did get it, was what, what would have happened if we hadn't come in? What I think would have happened is that the uh, with the backing of the Chinese, and I can't tell you the degree of Chinese participation, they would have started rolling up um, Thailand, Malaya, Singapore. And as that, be that began to happen, I think we would have reacted, no matter what the scale of the war. I don't think we would, we would have been prepared to see uh, China take over Indonesia, Singapore, Malaya, Thailand, not merely because we have a treaty, because uh, that would threaten everybody, <clears throat> including India, including Australia, New Zealand. And it would be treated just as if, when the Japanese went rolling down through that part of the world. Uh, President Johnson once addressed himself to that question and said something very much like this. He said, I cannot guarantee you that if we hadn't acted and don't act, that it will lead to a larger war, and a war in which quite possibly nuclear weapons would be used. But it is very possible, in my view, that that would happen, and it is my first duty to avoid that. And, it, and I can guarantee you that his, his view of the alternative, he, uh, there was one man, I won't name him, uh, who's rather famous for having been in the administration, and, and and sort of said that the war in Vietnam, if you get involved in Southeast Asia, will be terribly long and difficult, etc. And uh, afterwards, in writing his book, The Vantage Point, President Johnson referred to this man and said he was very persuasive about what horrors we'd get into, but he never answered the question, what would happen if we don't? And that was exactly the way he looked at it, that the the, the odds were very good that we'd have a much bigger war, perhaps a world war, and perhaps the use of nuclear weapons, if we let it go that far. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Ed Krupa from Clarksville. Well, what influence did the demonstrators and protesters have during the war? I always felt that uh, <clears throat> they kept the war, they kept uh, the northern Viet Cong going past the point where they might have stopped. The question is uh, what influence did the protesters have? I think they did have a heartening influence on, on Hanoi and the Viet Cong uh, because it so much echoed uh, their experience with the French and the decay of the French will to fight in Paris and so on. Uh, I don't think it was decisive, however, uh, and uh, it was a, a weight on the president, but he knew that the majority view was a hawk view in the country, about 60% even after Tet. And 
Uh, and I think it, in one part of his being, it hurt him to see young people and, and blacks and others whom he'd helped uh, so much uh, turn against him. And, but he, you know, he was a grown man and doing a grown man's job, and he took all of that um, stoically. And it didn't cause him to deviate at all in his own decisions. And I think politically it was an element, but a no, no, not, not a decisive element. And it was the time after Tet, when places of people like the Wall Street Journal began to publish reports. Uh, the whole, you know, it's, everything's lost and it's endless and all of that, which it wasn't. Uh, the, the hawks who defected at that time. There were senators who called me up and one of them uh, said, you know, I've been with you in all this, in the Kennedy and Johnson periods, and, and I've just been home for a week, and uh, the strongest supporters I have there are just sick of it and said, forget it. And that, that was, I think, more influential than the protesters. There's a question over here. Yes, Dr. Roth, uh, my name is Jason Sandoval. I'm a senior here at Hampton Sydney College. As a... Uh, National Security Advisor for Presidents Johnson and Kennedy, I hope I have your resume and your qualifications correct. Why were we in Vietnam from your perspective? We were in Vietnam because the treaty, CETO Treaty called for our being in Vietnam if Vietnam was attacked by communists. And it was attacked uh, after the 1954 agreement and after the 1962 agreement, 1962 agreement made a, uh, Hanoi committed itself to not viol violate Laos en route to any other country or, or infiltrate, and they violated it. And I wrote a memo at the time, uh, which came just after the Cuban Missile Crisis, when Mikoyan was about October 7th was the date that the Laos Accords went into effect. And from the State Department, I wrote a memorandum to the President saying, whatever we have to do, do it now, uh, to insist that the Laos Accords be, vi be honored, because uh, it's better to do it now, because things were pretty, going pretty well in 62, uh, than to act in a waning situation. But there was no question, we were there because that was what the treaty called for us to do, was to protect the protocol states. The signers of the treaty were protected explicitly in the protocol states, that is to say, South Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, uh, were, all, were, were put in a special protocol to be protected under the treaty. And they sure as hell were being attacked. Thank you very much. Question over here. I'm Charles Hummiller, a freshman at Hampton, Sydney. Um, I'm wondering, you've discussed some of the foreign policy Thanks and the political influences that the Vietnam War has had on America. How about the economic influences? How, are there any still in effect today? And if so, how long will they last in, uh, in our current society? Uh, the economic impact of the war in Vietnam was, uh, was very little. And that was because there'd been a big build up, uh, well, uh, there was a big, retreat from military expenditure after the Korean War, but in the late Eisenhower and early Kennedy periods it had risen back to about 10 percent. And uh, the increase uh, of 10 percent of GNP and the whole engagement in Southeast Asia only raised that by about 1 percent of GNP, whereas the jump for the Korean War was 10-12 percent. And uh, that was because the, the rate of growth in the economy was very high in that period. And uh, actually the peak comes in 1967, and it bids, the, the military expenditures begin to go down thereafter. Uh, I don't think the, the, the economic effects were substantial. Thank you. Question here, and then move to this side. Uh, Dr. Rastow, my name is Monroe Lee. I'm from Washington. I was a student here in 1938 at the time of the uh, Munich crisis, and I later served in the Pentagon at the time of the Dien Bien Phu crisis, and still later, in between practicing law, I was in the Department of State at the time of the evacuation from Vietnam. 
My question doesn't relate to those exactly, but one of the things I've always worried about as a advocate of containment was the policy of the Kennedy administration at the time of the fall of President Diem. Can you shed some light? Can you shed some light on the policy of the government at that critical period? The, uh, I, I had a, a long talk with Jim, uh, which I'll tell you about, but uh, on the debate within the administration as to what to do about Jim, uh, I was in the State Department and uh, all of that was handled in the White House. So I have no personal knowledge of the interplay of uh, Hillsman, Harriman, Ball, um, Bundy, you know, which is a, a cottage industry in discussing the, the final decision, you know, Lodge and so on. So I, I, I know no more than what's in any book about it. But I do know something about what it was that made it such a difficult issue. When I came out with General Taylor, Jim had apparently, or his, read a book of mine called Stages of Economic Growth on Development. And he urged that I go and talk with his brother New. And I spent the better part of a day with Brother New and somewhere I still have the notes from it. And I came away very deeply troubled because New uh, talked about his brother Jim and he said, oh, he's a sort of Mandarin Confucian. He's too soft. What we need is a hard organization that reaches out from the center and reaches down to the villages. And he was describing either a fascist or a communist structure in which he'd be the boss. And General Taylor and I moved around and we got a very clear impression of the view of Jim and of Nu. And the view of Jim was that he was extremely difficult, but he had kind of earned legitimacy because he had never been associated with the French. He was a true independent, a bit like Sigmund Rhee in Korea. And, uh, and you could, when you talked with, uh, in the final meeting, uh, Jim turned to me and said, I understand you had an interesting talk with my brother yesterday. And uh, tell me what your reflections are on visiting my country. And I said that I was very much impressed by the coming in of a new generation of military and civil people, and that if he, uh, that he had a chance to bring them along to be his successors in time, although he had to run the country now, but he had some good people to lean on. And he said, uh, no, he said, they just talk a good game. And I said, well, I deal with young people, and it's possible some of them talk better than they deliver. But I'm sure there are people there you can build for the future to have a structure. And he picked up the phone and waved it at me and he said, this is the only way to run the country. Now, what he was doing, in fact, was turning over more and more functions to new. And we on the Taylor Mission came to the conclusion that the, the new generation, technocratic generation, and the young military would never accept new as they had with all his difficulties, Jim. So there was a making of a tragedy there, and I tried very hard to get Edward Lansdale sent out to be an advisor to Jim, and the bureaucracy cut that down, and, he, and the ambassador, and so on. But I, I left very sad, because I, I saw an impasse, and that impasse grew, and I think it was at the root of the assassination. And uh, so but I, the details I don't know. That's the only background I can give you. Thank you. Yes, sir. So my name is David Blocker. I'm a sophomore here in Hampton, Sydney. And I had a question in regards to the declaration of war. Um, with the passing of the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, do you feel that that offered sufficient um, evidence to, to give President Johnson public support? Or do you feel that he should have tried to gain a declaration of war uh, with regards to public opinion back home in the States? That's a question I do know something about. When the time came to make the decision in July of 65, there were very detailed consultations on a bipartisan basis with the leadership of both the Senate and the House. And the question was raised as to whether there should be a declaration of war. 
And be clear, at that time, there was overwhelming support in the Congress for action, and the President was assured that it would go through. And that the polls showed at that time that there was public support in the New York Times and the Washington Post and uh, these other great institutions uh, were all for it. There was no declaration of war because of two people, Dean Rusk and Tommy Thompson. Uh, Dean Rusk said, we don't know what agreements might be triggered between Hanoi and Moscow and Hanoi and China if we had a de declaration of war. And he was backed in that position by Tommy Thompson, the ambassador to Russia. And it was a decision made uh, collectively in the light of the briefing of Rusk and Thompson to the leadership. And uh, it was, that was the inhibition and at the time it was accepted by the leadership that we should just go on and put in the troops we wanted to put in and not make a, a formal legal uh, case by declaring war on Hanoi. And that's a fair, that I can give you a fairly clear cut answer. Sir, you may have the, I uh, beg your pardon. Bob, uh, tell us who you are. Dr. Rothstein, my name is Robert Jones. I'm an administrator here at the college. Could you enlighten us as to the retrospective view of this conflict among countries more geographically threatened at the time, such as New Zealand, Australia, and India? Uh, yes. On, at the time we moved troops in, we had the support explicitly of, of uh, uh, New Zealand and Australia. And the, the quotation from Beale, which I paraphrased, uh, and I think I I've, I've, uh, can lay my hands on it now, it was uh, very much, uh, uh, was, very su was very supportive at the time. India was a very interesting case. And I'll tell you a story I've never really written up. Uh, uh, I was sent out in 1963 uh, by President Kennedy to make an independent assessment after the Cuban Missile Crisis and the crisis in the India-China War up there on the frontier in Ladakh. To see whether the negotiation which he'd, we'd helped encourage between India and Pakistan over uh, Kashmir might succeed. They were having a kind of permanent floating crap game of negotiators going from one city to another. and. Uh, in the course of it, the then ambassador to India asked me to take an afternoon off to talk with Chowdhury, General Chowdhury, who was chief of staff. And Chowdhury told me that India uh, was benefiting greatly and it was India's interest that we hold the line in Vietnam because India would be threatened if Thailand was threatened. Why? Because Thailand was the buffer uh, for Burma. And they were, the general view of the Indian general staff was that there were two threats to the Indian subcontinent, one through Burma and the other through Afghanistan. And that uh, he wanted us to know that what we were doing was in India's interest and they appreciated it. Uh, I then met the next day with the head of the foreign office, permanent head of the foreign office, civil servant, but of great influence in India. And I told him of this conversation. I said, I want to, I'm interested in it, but I don't feel I can report it until I get the view of other Indian officials. He said, of course, we all understand. And we all take the same view that the general does. And uh, either later that day or the next day, I met Nehru, you know, sniffing his rose and all. And uh, I put it to him. And he said, yes, I agree. It is our interest. Now, this is something, that, they never said out loud in public. They had acted against the communists when they threatened Malay Malaya in the Malayan period of insurrection. And they were very sensitive, obviously, to anything that was a recurrence of the drive of the Japanese. That was their haunting memory. And, uh, but I have no doubt that they, they had, uh, not unlike other countries at other times, had an inner position 
And, uh, but they had this desperate, they'd sold their souls to the devil on Kashmir. That is to say, the, for the Russian veto. And so they were, they were not about to take a public position in, in support of the United States and endanger the Russian veto that had been guaranteed them on Kashmir. And that's tragic. The whole story of Kashmir is tragic. But uh, there's, no, there's no doubt in my mind that the Indians understood, being intelligent people, that by, we were protecting their flank. We will close the session with one last question. Uh, Robert Harper, I graduated here in 1938. Uh, I'm a lawyer in Washington. I spent some eight months out in Vietnam uh, at the time of the uh, uh, 67, 68, uh, doing legal work, particularly in relation to the pacification effort. Uh, it's often been stated that we didn't do too well militarily because our people had to fight with one hand tied behind their back. But due to restrictions placed on them, and I'm thinking about bombing, interdiction of the Ho Chi Minh Trail, actions in the north. Uh, so that's my first question. How important do you think that was? And secondly, I wonder if you would comment on the question of uh, our captives in the north who were never accounted for. There's been a lot of, in the press recently uh, some stating that the numbers 400 American airmen and other captives who have not been uh, satisfactorily con uh, accounted for and may still be there. Uh, to take the second question first about the number who may not be accounted for, I'm afraid I really have no knowledge of that. That issue didn't arrive at a time I was a public servant because we were fighting the war. It arose when we made the truce with, uh, in 73, and one of the conditions of the truce was that the Hanoi account for, send back all American prisoners and account for those who were lost. And just what the evidence is one way or the other since that agreement, uh, I have no idea. On the other issue, one hand tied behind our backs, uh, there was an inhibition which I think President Johnson, before he died, uh, uh, felt that he should have uh, not had. He did not agree that we should mine the harbor at Haiphong. Uh, he thought that would, might be a, too provocative an act to nuclear powers. And uh, uh, he was amazed that we got away with the use of B-52s bombing Hanoi Haiphong around the Christmas of 1972. And I, f I know, actually, that his last reflections before he died were that he felt he hadn't used enough power. Now, uh, my own view, uh, and what way he would have, what he had in mind, I don't know, and I, I say that in public because he said that to someone else who has quoted him about the same period uh, before he died. Uh, but the, in my mind, the real issue wasn't the question of use of force. Uh, we used an awful lot of force, but I think we didn't use air power very intelligently, except at one phase. I think the use of air power in defense, Quezon, was brilliant. And General Momeyer, any of you know him, I thought was a great uh, air planner. Uh, and after that, until we had the halting bombing halt, uh, 31st of March, 1968, uh, air power was used intelligently. But the real thing, in my judgment, was neither was was the un was was to stop the infiltration, because the whole history of guerrilla war is that it's extremely difficult to cope with if you have an open frontier. Uh, the rate of uh, exchange, the number of people that an infiltrator can tie up is 10 to 15. And it's a very difficult game to, to win a guerrilla war uh, if the frontier is open. And uh, that's a lesson of many occasions. And one of the reasons it was, it was winnable in the Philippines was the frontier wasn't open. And they took some pains to close it in the Malayan uh, guerrilla war. And uh, 
we didn't. And that is, I don't, well, that would have involved going into Laos, but in a part of Laos that where nobody lived. And uh, it would have been much more, there'd be much more conservation of civilian life if we'd taken that road than the rather laborious road we did. Dr. Ross Bell, to, uh, I think we agree that to understand a world, we have to call on witnesses, call on memories, call on thoughtful, persistent analysis. Thank you for bringing all three to this session. We reconvene in three hours. Thank you very much.